Hello everyone, I am Divya Mohan and today I am super stoked to be speaking at the Open Source Summit Japan. I shall be delving a bit into how um, we can make our open source communities um, more uh, effective in terms of um, engaging and sustaining new contributors as uh, well as the existing ones. Now, um, before I dive right in, I would love to take out a couple of minutes and um, introduce you to myself. So, as aforementioned, I am Devya Mohan and I am currently a team lead with HSBC. Um, over and above which, I am the co-chair for uh, Special Interest Group Documentation on the Kubernetes as well as the Litmus Chaos project. I um, also had the extreme good fortune of being awarded the CNCF ambassador title last year. And uh, I'm extremely passionate about, um, uh, you know, getting folks started on their open source journey. So I sort of wiggled my way into the co-organizer role for the CNCF student user group as well. Um, I also am an author of the Friday Four newsletter, which I just started as an accountability tool a couple of weeks back. And um, there are a bunch of other stuff that I do, including speaking at uh, conferences and events globally. Uh, which have sort of helped me in my cloud native journey. But to be really honest, um, I did not start off like this. None of us do, right? We all start at the rock bottom, not knowing how to um, sort of navigate our uh, path in the open source ecosystem. And we all are in requirement of uh, some sort of help or mentorship. Now, it's not to say that um, open source communities um, are unwelcoming or we're extremely hostile. Um, that is not the takeaway here. But as veterans, if I may um, call us all, uh, call us all that uh, particular term, we forget how it is to actually have started off and um, how tough it is to navigate the ecosystem because um, from that st uh, from the standpoint that we are in currently we seem to sort of have all figured it out um, but that's not the case obviously and um, even in a, uh, you know in a in a contributor journey wherein a person is pretty far ahead um, they probably still might need assistance in navigating their ecosystem. No shame in that because I was one of those people. So, um, and it's very easy to um, sort of get demotivated um, as well. Because um, let's face it, open source communities um, are primarily based on voluntary contributions from contributors across the globe. And if we are speaking about um, engaging and sustaining these contributors, it, that it is not a one-stop shop answer. You basically are looking at a multifaceted problem. And uh, some of those problems or barriers are what I am hoping to cover today. And towards the end of the presentation, I do hope to sort of um, come from the standpoint of now being a co-chair and, um, you know, help with, you know, I wouldn't say advice, but help with some suggestions that can sort of make our communities more inclusive. So let's dive right in. Now, when we speak about open source, right, uh, we have a very uh, vast ecosystem uh, to start off with. So uh, when we, when I started personally contributing to open source, what um, was confusing to me is um, at what 
point am i supposed to be a member and uh, this is not because there was no clear contribution ladder defined um it was there within the communities that i got involved but it's just that those contribution ladders and guides that are supposed to surface um during a potential contributor search right they did it they did not surface and uh, to be honest i was really confused for around um say the first couple of months as to when i actually uh, you know could call myself a member of um, you know a particular open source project um and i know for a fact that a lot of people who start with open source have the same problem because yes there are uh, many projects have um, contribution guides listed down since now um, with people from all areas um, trickling in we definitely understand that not everybody knows git or you know the programming languages associated with your project but what there is a lack of is a contribution ladder and that to a clear contribution ladder um explaining to that particular contributor how they will be able to sort of um go up to the next level sure there's a diagram uh, sure there is uh, you know um you know a detailing of how uh, the different contributor levels are organized within the hierarchy of a particular project but how do you get from level a to say level b that is something that is very vague and to to be very honest um it again differs from project to project um most projects do not have this so there is a definite lack of incentive um for the contributor getting involved to actually aspire to uh, become a contributor because after i start contributing then what is this just going to be a line on my resume what do i continue doing here um there's no there's no guidance and and i mean it in the best possible way um we need to have really clear contribution ladders defined in terms of it not just being a diagram but it needs to have specific directions on how contributors who are new to the project can ascend that ladder what are the actual um Uh, what are the actual tenets or the actual preconditions that a contributor must fulfill when moving from level a to level b to level z so that sort of gives a structure to the contribution journey of an individual contributor to the project and also gives an aspirational level uh, for the contributor to um, you know have while starting out his journey again this is uh, not a one stop shop and is not a one size fits all solution because um even with contribution ladders defined there are and contribution guides being in place there are there are several other uh, barriers that come in um during you know your contribution journey one of them which really uh you know is pretty close to my heart is that of time zone jet lag now as we already probably know uh open source communities are global in nature um and it's one of the factors that makes it appealing to any new contributor imagine having to uh, you know work on something uh, alongside folks from across the globe and um, gain from you know gain knowledge from those conversations and interactions you have um what and all of this is um you know at um at 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 a you know at a very visible level wherein you um actually get to interact with other folks in the same industry as you when you are in a uh, particular organization whether it be academic or you know corporate or um, you know 
any other type of organization you are restricted to your own tech bubble you are restricted to the people you work with you are restricted to the colleagues that you interact with on a day to day basis but imagine having colleagues that are uh, colleagues who are situated across the globe that's what an open source community offers you but with this comes the flip side that um most meetings are exclusionary for uh, some time zones um primarily because um you know the open source movement has sort of started gaining traction in these time zones um later than they did in the initial uh, stages so obviously uh you know when when it comes to engagement of contributors from that time zone um it's it's clearly on a low and uh, the contributor basically does not have any avenue for sort of uh you know interacting with their uh global colleagues as i call them and um, when you know there are initially very less contributors um, from a particular part of the world there aren't going to be a lot that follow because only when you see somebody who looks like you who probably well, you know speaks your language who is a lot like you in uh, every sense of the term uh will you be a, uh, will you be confident enough to join a community because otherwise you are going to deem a particular um you know group exclusionary so representation matters and having that representation in the form of the various time zones that um <coughs> sorry that the community operates in is extremely essential without which what tends to happen is you know obviously the engagement decreases as i have for mentioned uh the contributor is demotivated and even if they actually sustain uh manage to sustain or you know juggle their professional and um, you know open source commitments um they are setting themselves up for burnout and not for success because burning the midnight oil has never ever really benefited anyone um especially when you are a working professional who has to sort of balance uh, your personal life your professional life and your open source commitment on the side so um over and about just the time zone bit right um we have various languages coming in as well from each of these time zones um and most of them uh, do not have english as their primary language but when you look at the documentation that's available on the internet for all of the um you know open source projects out there the primary language that they're written in is in english um now english is not um the primary or native language um in most of the countries um outside of um the us or eu and um i wouldn't say that this is a hindering factor but it definitely would help if we have um you know uh these differences accounted for when we you know write documentation or any sort of um, material that is consumed by audience towards adoption during the adoption of the project because um languages at this point in time when technology has come so far should not be a deterring factor for uh, the adoption of a technology or a tool and it definitely should not be one of the reasons why um, you know contributors who are from a uh, non english uh, native country are uh, sort of you know not able to get involved so we definitely must account for this and like i said towards the end of the presentation i hope to leave you all with some pointers on how this can be done and the last one that i really would like to talk extensively about because 
a lot of the um, you know problems uh, stem from this particular point. Um, open source projects so far have been voluntary contributions by the respective contributors. Um, and uh, only some contributors uh, have support from their employers towards actually contributing, uh, which means that they are either paid um, for, you know, working on um, whatever project they're working on during that, uh, during their hours of working, or they are incentivized in some other fashion to actually work on that open source project, like building a, uh, you know, building their own, um, uh, building their own organization around the project or something of that sort. But most corporate consumers, and by most, I really do mean most, um, are passive adopters of the, um, you know, open source projects that are out there. Open source has actually enabled, uh, open source projects have actually enabled, um, you know, thousands of managed offerings to come out from various service providers and even, uh, you know, the, the actual offering itself has sort of reaped various benefits for people who have adopted it. But unfortunately, um, corporate consume, uh, corporate customers or corporate, uh, you know, organizations do not find the incentive to actually, uh, you know, contribute in this, um, in this space. The reason being, um, A, uh, why would I let my employee work during the working hours um, on a project that basically is just a tool that is sort of being used in my organization? It's a very good question, but it also has a very good answer at this point. So when you are uh, sort of allowing your employee um, to work on an open source pro uh, project, you are uh, in an upstream manner or in whatever other fashion that you, you choose to support, you are actually enabling that project to receive um, feedback from your company's side, which means that at some point in time, consumers like you can have a say in the way that project's um, end goal shapes up. And of course, when you actually have an employee interacting with so many other folks from across the IT space, um, they definitely stand to learn a lot more than what they would um, when they just are relegated to their tech bubble. So there is a benefit, but it is not an immediate and a quick one, which is probably why, you know, Co uh, corporate customers do not, uh, you know, view open source projects as something that they can, um, you know, fit into their um, um, employees' working hours. But as of now, um, the sustainability of all open source projects is at stake because as vastly as this ecosystem is growing, we are in in a state wherein there's an excessive demand of contributors. There always was a demand, but there is an excessive demand given the scale at which we are growing. And if there is no support from corporate uh, customers towards, you know, the helping these projects flourish, um, it is the projects that will suffer. And how? Um, if you may, uh, if you're asking that, the contributors a, um, even if uh, you know they are not incentivized in terms of monetary compensation or however else uh, the organization chooses to compensate them, they are more prone to burnout because whatever work um, upstream or otherwise that they will be doing is out of their working hours. Now, the pandemic sort of allows us to do work um, or, you know, juggle work um, when we are in the comfort of our homes. But 
once you know we return back to normalcy whenever that is um it's not going to be as easy for a lot of us to sort of contribute and you know have a day job and manage our personal life um if there is no support from the organization over and above which a lot of organizations also have restrictive policies which clearly um, you know state that uh, voluntary contributions are not allowed um unfortunately that's a very sad space to be in at this point given that almost all the um, all the software that's out there all the uh, products that we use in our day to day life including your laptops your cell phones your whatever are in some way or the other powered by an open source project um so it's extremely essential that corporate organizations are as much a part of this whole um, you know ecosystem as uh, you know a co uh, contributor is because only when there's support um from uh, you know corporate organizations that are actively consuming this um will the you know balance sort of be um restored because at this point in time there are more takers than there are makers so there is a clear um you know tilt in the balance current um you know of the ecosystem because you can only give up to a point of exhaustion after which it's not possible for a project to you know sort of continue sustainably any further so um uh, that's a bit about you know how corporate organizations lack of support can affect the project and you know potentially be a barrier in sort of uh, engaging and sustaining contributors but fret not there are options and there are solutions but again since this is a multifaceted problem you have to choose what works best for you and how you uh, you should best engage the relevant stakeholders i know stakeholder is a very um, corporate term but the way ahead for many open source communities would be to a tighten and standardize their governance codes of conduct and their licensing now um codes of conduct are uh, all of these that i have mentioned actually are um, very important uh, for contributors and for the participating organizations to a certain who does what and how they end up doing it so basically defining contributor ladders in a way that would possibly help the um, you know contributor and potentially their employer or uh, you know wherever whatever organization they are affiliated to understand how they will fit into the ecosystem and what is the uh, level they can aspire to you know jump to would be a great starting point um in this whole journey codes of conduct obviously um you know is i believe a very uh, are i believe a very um, you know fundamental thing that should be a part of every open source community because the stronger the code of conduct um the safer your contributor audience feels um because it's at the end of the day a um, community driven initiative and if there are no contributors um you know if there is no safe space for the contributors to you know participate in um and it is not governed by a code of conduct that enforces certain um rules around the interaction um there can be bad actors at play so that's that's how it works and um once you have your contributor ladder defined it's also very essential to have well detailed contribution guides now i don't mean that the existing ones are really bad but they definitely could do with um, you know improving improving the reason being um 
contribution guides are your uh, are supposed to be surfaced when your uh, contributor actually searches for uh, you know how to get started on an open source project if that is not surfacing there is clearly a problem because uh, they won't know where to start and that is not a very good thing given that you know um, you know they might be demotivated at step 1 itself so having better contribution guides and having them surface during actual uh, you know searches is a very important thing and i mentioned a lot about uh, you know uh, time zone jet lag and um, being more inclusive um, so one of the things um, that code of conduct does is uh, or at least should do is promote inclusivity within you know a project but over and about that i believe that having a having an async mode of communication such as an irc slack discord there are multiple products out there at this point so using one of those and um, and preferring those channels uh, to you know be uh, avenues for decision making as opposed to you know in person zoom meetings would be really beneficial for everyone involved primarily because a lot of us tend to view meetings and uh, this is not blaming anyone uh, a lot of us tend to view meetings as um, an avenue for decision making and if people are not able to sort of attend you know a meeting because of uh, you know time zone problems they are not in the loop and the moment they are out of the loop it's it's a you know spiral from there so have uh, having um, a sync meetings or slack stand ups or discord stand ups or whatever else is a better way to facilitate that uh, decision making over an async platform and if we have um, you know if we have you know concerns over there not being actual in person zoom meetings for certain time zones um you can also actually include separate time uh, separate meetings for the time zones that have lesser representation in your current meetings because that will help folks from that particular time zone to gather and uh, ask questions um and you know see the people who they are talking to rather than just uh, being a uh, you know picture on slack or discord or whatever the other uh, you know modes of communication are and of course i also spoke about linguistic differences being one of the barriers now um the way we at kubernetes um you know try to solve this is by introducing documentation localization uh which basically is a nice word for uh, multiple language support it would help in a lot of ways because like i said before the audience that you're catering to is global and not uh, you know country or continent specific having um, documentation that caters to a wider audience and a more global audience is only going to make your uh, project more accessible and inclusive as well as diverse and like like the last uh, like i mentioned in the last slide slide sorry um we require more support from corporate consumers who are who have so far been uh, passive consumers uh, or adopters uh, it is necessary for them to become part of that feedback loop and ensure that there are contributors to that product uh, project because without their feedback and without their um, you know input the project is going to suffer from an imbalance like i mentioned and um, the way they can do that is by incentivizing employees to actually work on the project during company time or uh, you know having them uh, work on it um via other you know uh, compensatory methods but as a um, standard it is required for them to actually uh, incentivize their employees to work on open source projects because there is definitely an imbalance and a massive one at that if we don't 
uh, you know if we actually continue doing the same that we are if we can or actually continue on the same path that we are on right now so um that's it from me for today and i hope you enjoyed uh, you know the slightly dry um presentation on a lot of uh, community engagement thank you for you know all your time and your attention and i hope you have a great event ahead thank you once again Bye-bye.